My name is John Erickson and I'm the Wild and Scenic River Manager of the White Salmon and Klickitat Rivers. In this film, we'll explore the Wild and Scenic White Salmon River with local experts to learn about how we can all be stewards of this river. The Forest Service seeks to support and educate river users about the best practices to use in order to protect spawning salmon, prevent the spread of invasive species, and maintain a natural and undisturbed shoreline environment. Together, we can all be stewards of the wild and scenic White Salmon River and continue to support its recovery after the historic removal of Condit Dam in 2011. The Wild and Scenic White Salmon River is a popular recreation and angling destination with an estimated 50,000 users annually. The Forest Service has been working closely with the National Marine Fisheries Service, U.S. Geological Survey, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife to minimize the impacts from river users. Together, we have created easy to follow guidelines that recreationists and outfitter guides can use to protect spawning fish on the White Salmon River. My name is Ian Jezorek. I'm a fisheries biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. Since the removal of Condit Dam, uh, we've been excited to document salmon and steelhead spawning upstream of the former dam site. We've found coho salmon juveniles in uh, several of the tributaries upstream of the former dam site. Spring Chinook salmon have actually been found spawning above Hewson Falls. Adult steelhead have been documented spawning in the tributaries as well in uh, Mill Creek, uh, Buck Creek, Spring Creek, and Rattlesnake Creek are the four major tributaries that provide spawning habitat. Uh, in addition to that, with the removal of the dam and the downstream movement of much of the sediment, cobbles, and gravels that were trapped behind the dam, spawning area for salmon and steelhead downstream of the dam site has increased significantly. So there have been not just habitat opened up by removal of the dam, but habitat improvement for fish downstream of the dam for spawning and for rearing. A red is essentially a salmon nest. It's where the females uh, will lay deposit their eggs. Generally speaking, they're going to be on larger gravel beds or in what we call a tail out area of a pool or a run where the bottom starts to come up and the current speed starts to increase a little bit. The female salmon will come in to deposit her eggs and she'll scoop out a depression area in the gravel or cobble. So they'll lay on their side, flip their tails, move the gravel back a bit. And as they're doing this, they're slowly depositing a layer of eggs, scooping out some gravel on top of those eggs, laying down some more eggs, scooping out some more gravel. So the final shape of a red, which can be up to four or five feet in diameter or even a little larger with some of the big fall chinook, what you'll see is essentially a divot or, or a, a scooped out area in the gravel or cobble. And then downstream of that, there'll be a mound of newly disturbed gravel under which the eggs lay. Often the best way to identify a red is by color. Because when the fish, when the female fish are in there, they're moving the gravel and cobble with their, with their tail. So when you look down into the river and you see the river bottom, and it generally looks kind of dark, gray or brown, but a red will appear brighter color. Reds in the White Salmon River could be found uh, nearly anywhere within the river that's accessible to anadromous fish. The highest concentration of reds, particularly in the fall, uh, are actually downstream of the former dam site. When salmon and steelhead come back to spawn, uh, they're often in fairly weakened condition um, they're stressed, they've had a long journey from the sea and they're putting all their energy into production of eggs and sperm and into actual spawning act. The less disturbance they face, the greater chance they have of spawning successfully. Once the eggs are laid down in the gravel, they're very susceptible to being dislodged or actually crushed by someone walking on the gravel. So it's important if you see fish spawning or you see reds, to give them a berth, give the fish a break, try not to stress them out. 
And then during the spawning period, or particularly if you see reds or spawning fish, to avoid walking or grounding your boat in gravel areas or, or areas where there may be reds, or there may be eggs incubating in the gravel, even if you don't see the red. Each year, beginning on August 12th through the end of October, we ask river users to follow these extra precautions to further protect spawning fish and reds. Specifically, we ask river users to stay in their boats, avoid swimming, wading, jumping in the river, and minimize excessive noise. Consolidate your group, stay in the deep channel, and when possible, keep paddles out of the water. Anglers are encouraged to use established paths and trails to access the river and prevent degradation of the shoreline. Anglers must also avoid walking and wading through reds during spawning season. Another goal is to protect trees and vegetation along the shoreline. Shorelines are critical for wildlife habitat, stabilization of a riverbank, and maintain the beauty of the river corridor. All river users are encouraged to clean, drain, and dry their river gear and boats in order to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species, especially when coming from watersheds already affected, like the Deschutes, Snake, and Columbia Rivers. There are several invasive species that can significantly alter the river ecosystem, threaten recreational opportunities, cause economic impacts, and even threaten human health. My name is Paul Heimowitz. I'm an invasive species specialist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Pacific Region. Managing invasive species is a huge challenge in part because once they're established, we have very few success stories where they can be eliminated. So it really becomes kind of a one-shot deal to keep them out of a new area. So as important as early detection is, Community members are really most critical as that front line for prevention. They're the ones who are most frequently using those resources, have the most at stake in some ways as well, and can be models for those who may be coming from outside the area on how to best clean and prevent introductions of new invaders into their watershed. So this is the New Zealand mud snail, and you can see how tiny they are. That's one of the reasons they're such great invaders. Um, they're very hard to eliminate um, if they might be in your gear. It only takes one New Zealand mud snail to start an entire new population. They are clone, clonal reproducers. The way that the nearby Deschutes River has been affected by invasive species is um, maybe first and foremost that the system's irreparably changed. Um, there are species like New Zealand mud snails, bullfrogs, a number of different aquatic plants um, that will likely not ever be eliminated from the system. Then you have recreational impacts um, where some areas are no longer accessible or even just the secondary impact of the need to contain these new invasions in the Deschutes watershed to the point that it starts to really complicate, um, for example, being able to move uh, aquatic gear, angling gear from point A to point B because there are now these additional precautions that need to be taken. So it just complicates the ability to enjoy the river. So there are some fairly simple and doable things that anglers, paddlers, kayakers, rafters um, can do to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species to the White Salmon River watershed. The, the basic mantra is clean, drain, and dry the equipment to the best of your ability. But particularly for something like the New Zealand mud snail, which is a good target, it's the one thing we really you know, want to eliminate. Um, Drying for at least 24 hours is particularly critical, and that, that means making sure there's no moisture during that 24-hour period. So not just putting something out in the sun for 24 hours, but making sure that if it's a kayak, the seats are out and thoroughly dry, um, that there are no um, nooks or crannies where there's moisture where those, you know, that just that one mud snail can be um, hiding and still thriving. For more information and to get involved with the community, visit the Columbia Gorge National Scenic Area, share the White Salmon River, and Friends of the White Salmon River websites and Facebook pages.